are gonna love this interview. Just got done editing it. I'm glad I got it live for you. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes hanging out, answering any questions you have. In fact, leave a comment below about data points or what you think is gonna happen to the company and I will respond to every comment. Additionally, if you're just loving the content, click the thumbs up and I will go and check out your profile as well and give your videos some love as well. In the meantime, enjoy the interview. Hello everyone, my guest today is George Arison. He's the co-founder of Shift, an online marketplace disrupting the used car industry. An immigrant from Georgia and lifelong entrepreneur, he also co-founded the first on-demand mobile transportation booking technology called Taxi Magic, now known as Curb, as well as working for Google and BCG. George, you ready to take us to the top? I'm happy to. All right, so uh, let's jump into the business model. For people that haven't used Shift, uh, I- explain exactly how they use it. Is this for renting cars or buying cars or all the above? It's for, it's for both selling and buying cars. So there's two parts of the business. If you have a car to sell, you come to our website, we price the car for you, and then we'll buy it from you. Um, we'll pick it up from you at your location. You can drop it off at our location, whichever one you want to do. Um, that's available in all of California and, and all of Oregon. And then if you want to buy a car, you have three ways to buy a car. You can either um, have a test drive you brought to you at your house or your office, um, or you can come to our warehouse to look around, kind of like you would go to Costco, or you can buy a car sight unseen online, and then it'll be shipped to you um, anywhere in the country. Um, and you know we sell a very broad range of cars, all used, but anywhere from one to you know 12 years in age. Buying a car, if I want to go into the warehouse, get a little test drive in, I imagine that's restricted by location. Is that also only in California or Oregon? That that is yes. So we ship anywhere, but the delivery of the test drive to you um, is available in about eighty percent of California and and in Oregon, uh, and then coming to us is you know at our locations in the same location, same states. Okay, and and let's role play here for a second so I can understand how you're building a business around this. I have a twenty thousand two thousand nine Prius, gray Prius. Uh, yep. I submit it to you guys. You give me a price on the website, I assume. Yeah, we'll tell you what we're going to buy the car for on, online. And if you like that, then you can just schedule an, an appointment for someone to come and pick it up. Um, they'll pick up the car and then we'll wire your money as an ACH transaction uh, within a couple of days. Um, and then we'll fix the car. So we go, go through reconditioning on all the cars that we sell. Um, and then uh, we'll then take photos and list the car for sale. Uh, and then a buyer will find the car on ship.com and choose either to buy it right away or choose to do a test drive, you know, having it be brought to them, which is kind of like the really unique feature of what Shift does, or they can come to us to see the car uh, as well. Given the what's happening, you know, and people don't want to go to stores, I, we actually are really excited about leaning into a test drive to deliver to you, right? Yep. Because kind of are avoiding seeing most people when you do that. I want to dive into that here and the virus and how it's impacting your business here in a second. But first, yeah. I want to go uh, just make sure I really understand the business model here. I assume what you're actually doing here when you're giving me an offer on my 2009 Gray Prius is you're listing and essentially selling it beforehand or you know what you can sell it for. Uh, we know what we can. We, we don't actually list them beforehand. We thought about doing that, but we've not done that yet. But we, we do know what we can sell it for because we have a fairly complex pricing algorithm that we use to kind of understand where the market is. And then we try to give sellers an offer that's usually better than what they would get trade in or if they sold the car or or close to what they would get if they sold the car themselves. Uh, And then we sell a car, you know, at 98, 99% to market. um, So roughly where the market kind of generally is um, and then make margins on the difference. Plus we make money on, you know, financing warranty and other attached products that you can get when you buy a car. So it's very similar to what a dealership would do, except sell it as a little bit better and the buyer gets a way better experience because the test drives are bought to them yep. rather than them having to go to a store. You, I assume, in your uh, assumption sales that drive the margins you want to make, ignoring the upsells of financing and warranties, uh, you have a, an assumption sell that to optimize for that. So if you are going to pay me, I'm going to make the math easy, 10000 for my 2009 Gray Prius, you know you can sell that for what on the other side? Yeah, probably something like um, eleven uh, eleven thousand five hundred is ca- kind of what we try to aim- target, meaning like a margin of fifteen hundred dollars, and then some portion of that goes to um, recondition the car, right? So we that's not our, our full profit, um, but that's very rough um, because it all depends on the kind of car you're dealing with, right? And we have a segment in our business that we call value auto, so these are cars that are um, below twelve thousand dollars in price and over 80,000 miles on them. Um, they're actually very, very popular. You would be surprised, but the twice as much demand as for the, happens for those cars as for everything else. 
um, even though they're older. Um, and so for that car, we actually do less reconditioning, right? So there we try to have a lot more margin on the car itself, less reconditioning, because we know that we're going to make less margin on the warranty and the loan because the price of the car is so low, there's not a lot of margin to be made there. On the other hand, you know, for a more expensive vehicle, like a BMW that's only four years old, you actually are okay making less margin on the car itself because you know that most likely somebody's going to get a loan when they buy that car and you'll make margin there. So kind of our goal overall is to make money kind of in aggregate, right, on the full transaction, knowing that some cars will make more money on the metal and some cars will make more money on the finance. In that value cohort, less than $12,000 price point, more than 80,000 miles on the car, you'll juice your margin there. What, you'll double it 30% or you stick to closer to 15? No, we'll still stick to about, uh, you know, 15 to 20%. But we'll do less reconditionings, right? So if we may, we might make two thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars on that car, um, but we'll recondition only four or five hundred dollars because buyers of those cars don't care so much about appearance. They care about safety and the car running really well, but they know that they're not buying a you know a new car or one that's in perfect condition on the outside in terms of what it looks like. But they're getting a car for you know that's safe and good for ten thousand dollars, and all the cars are brought to them for a test drive. So it's actually a really great experience in a world where you're buying a cheaper vehicle. Yep. And that, that cohort for you, you, you I imagine you still finance, you just make less there because the, the, the aggregate amount right. is less. Yeah. We still finance and you make less. Um, we, we still sell warranties as well, but obviously less people choose to buy a warranty. If you're buying a $10,000 car. You might not worry about that so much. Now for us, like we've been doing what we call value cars always although we figured a lot of, out about them over the years and now it's a pretty big part of our business is about 20 to 25 to 30% of our business. But in a world that we're headed to now with, you know, economy heading into a recession, my guess is that cohort is going to become more and more in demand, right? Because people are going to have a harder time obtaining financing for more expensive cars. And so suddenly cars that are cheaper and older and safer or are still safe are going to be more, more in demand. Why do you believe that with the Fed cutting interest rates to zero, lending should ideally get easier? Um, yes, if you have good credit and if you have a job, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are going to be left without work. Um, and uh, my guess is that people are also going to try to avoid transportation uh, and avoid ride sharing. Right. So my hunch is that demand for used cars over the next couple of quarters is going to jump. Um, because of everything that's kind of going on. It, very interesting. Okay. Um, before we jump, so we're talking like pre-sale up to the sale. We understand your margins. Yeah. There's a whole other side of your business we'll get to in a second on the financing, the warranty, et cetera. Before we do that though, put this all on a timeline for us. When did you launch the company? So Shift's been around since 2014. We sold our first car in June of 2014. Okay. Um, so we'll be about six years in sales since, you know, in, in a quarter or so. Take, so tell the story here, 2015, how many car sales? Um, I don't actually remember our numbers every year, but overall we've grown roughly 30 to 50% every year we've been around. Okay. Um, and if you, if you take our Kager in terms of volume and we finished last year with, um, 11,500 cars, uh, 11,500 cars sold. Yeah. In, in just in 2019 or hist all historically? No, no, no. In just in 2019, we've serviced about 60,000 customers in the life of the company on both the sell side and the buy side. Okay, got it. So I could take 11,500 total cars sold in 2019, then just subtract 30% growth year over year, and kind of backtrack back to the beginning. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Okay, and then what's your, again, we have a lot of uncertainty right now. What's your target for 2020? What do you think you'll grow 11,500 um, to? We were hoping to do, you know, something like 16 to 17,000 cars this year. Um, now we'll see what happens, right? Like uh, some things are gonna be positive and some things are gonna be really negative. Um, really hard to tell. Like literally, the I was in a meeting just now, planning like what happens if the state tells us, "Hey, business can't exist at all for a month. Like shut everything down. What do you do?" Um, so there's just like it's, it's a lost your audio, George. Uh, yeah. Now you're back. Yeah. You're back. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. By so, the way, look, nobody knows, right? Even Wall Street analysts are saying this is the hardest quarter we've ever had to predict because you just have no freaking clue. So with, I mean, yeah. what did take me in that meeting to the extent you can? I mean, how do you think about our plan for this? Well, I mean, it's so I think for a lot of tech companies, it's a lot easier to plan. And for us, because they just have like a very office based workforce, right, that it even is coding or is selling. And so when people start talking about work from home, that's a lot easier to arrange. We have a much harder time with that because we actually have to be in, in the retail business as well. 
So we have like a two faceted workforce and what happens on the retail side is very different and it's a different type of uh, employee than typical Silicon Valley startup employee. Um, and, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, they're the ones who are that type of an employee is the one that's hit the most in times like this in terms of kind of, um, you know, wages, et cetera, et cetera. So we just kind of we don't have any answer yet. We're just trying to figure out what's going to happen and what our options are. At this point, that's what we're working on. We were still in business this weekend. We actually had a reasonably good weekend, um, better than I had expected that we'd have, um, which is good. Um, now, again, like if a test drive is brought to you, you don't really actually come in contact with that many people, right? So um, it's the same as if you're ordering delivery for, for food, et cetera. So I think that piece is really positive. And then, of course, buy it now. You know, literally you buy a car sight unseen, you pay for it online or, uh, you know, through digital means, and then the car is delivered to you. That we're going to keep going no matter what, because we might not be able to fulfill those orders right away if the, you know, things get shut down, but we'll be able to fulfill those orders later. And in a world where a lot of people are sitting at home and kind of have nothing to do, right? They're they shopping for are, cars online, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the other, so we have noticed a jump in our traffic to the website. Um, so our buyer visitor, like we track buyer visitors on our site and as well as seller visitors, buyer visitors has definitely jumped over the last week. Yep. And what, just to get a sample here, you're like, your, your kind of averages are dangerous. 25 to 30% of the business is less than a $12,000 sale, but what's your average car go for through the platform? 20, oh, 30 grand? Yeah, it's, yeah we, we, our average price ranges by time of year and kind of how we manage the inventory, but somewhere between 15 and $17,000. 15 and 17,000. Um, okay. Yeah. Got it. I mean, Probably so I can, I can take then, I can take then 11,500 car sales last year times the high of 17,000. I mean, you did, you almost sold $200 million worth of cars last year. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's I mean, that's right. obviously impressive. How do you, how does that, I just don't know this industry stats. How does that compare to other car sales folks? Yeah. I mean, the way I tend to think about it is like Carvana, which is a public company that have been public for about three years now. They got started out of a larger dealership chain, kind of as a digital play. Um, so they went public uh, in 2017. In 2016, they did um, about 17,000 cars uh, and about 300 million in revenue. So that kind of sets in context, like this year is meant to be our pre-IPO year, right? Because if we do the revenue and the volume that we're projecting, we'd be in, in fairly good shape to go public next year. Now, again, who knows what happens and things might get delayed and changed and whatnot. Um, our unit economics generally have been a lot stronger than theirs were um, prior to IPO. So we've also kind of never really pushed for crazy, crazy growth because there's a balance between how fast you can grow and, and the unit economics story. Um, you know, the industry as a whole is massive. 45 million used cars are going to be sold uh, in the U.S. this year. Um, and yeah, it's about $750 um, billion dollars in used and another um, $600 billion in new. So the industry is really, really massive, but it's super fragmented. So the largest car seller that sells new, new and used sells about a million cars a year. Who's that? Um, I, 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 AutoNation. Okay, got it. Um, so, um, so like, and then CarMax is a used car only seller, also does about 750,000 used, right? So the largest players have like sub 1% of the market overall between used and new. So it's a very, very fragmented, fragmented. industry, unlike anything else uh, in the US. Yep. Um, and really kind of, you know, but... In each kind of congressional district, dealerships are oftentimes a lot, some of the largest employers and some of the most profitable businesses. So it's this kind of give and take that there's a lot of political influence, um, obviously, that comes We have that. five minutes left. Let's shift to the yeah. other part of your business, which is very interesting. Uh, you sell the car. You're potentially you know, putting a loan out. There's financing. There's warranties. Yeah. Let's assume you sell me a $20,000 car. I have generally kind of okay to good credit. What's that? What are yeah. those loan terms going to look like from you? So we work with banks to provide financing. We don't do financing on our own. Um, so we have, you know, almost a dozen banks on the back end, it's called, that are providing financing. And what we do is we have technology that's unique in the industry, does not exist anywhere else, that allows you to submit your information to us all digitally. And then we're actually able to pre-qualify you for, for a loan to understand what kind of loan you will qualify for and give you a sense of what your monthly payment on that loan is going to be, what the interest rate will be, et cetera. And you can kind of change that, right? So, okay, well, I actually am happy at paying a high interest rate, but I want lower down payment or I want a high down payment, low interest rate. It's how you can kind of manage that yourself. George, why give that revenue right to banks? Why, why don't you do that yourself? Ra raise more debt, do it yourself. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Just let me finish. And then we then 
once we know that you want to buy, we'll go out to our banks and say, hey, which of these banks can finance this loan? And now we know enough about which banks finance what kind of loans to kind of go to the right banks. And then they come back with the actual loan product, which will generally match what we told you in, in advance. That's called pre-qualification. Customers actually love it. Since we launched it about six months ago, um, people who go through it are twice as likely to buy a car versus people who don't, which is really awesome. Um, when we started Shift, the plan always was to do what is called capital lending, where you actually finance the loans yourself, then go get debt and securitize and resell. Wait, sorry, George, sorry, but, before you tell more of that story, on on when you give the loan to the bank, yeah. how do you make money on that? They pay you a referral fee or what? They, they, they pay you a fee for that, yeah. Tied to what, percent of the interest that they're making or? It varies by the bank, but you know, it ranges from like 200 bucks on the very low end, if you have a really amazing credit and a very low interest rate to like 700, 800 bucks. On, so it's on a the fixed, it's on just time. a fixed fee basically. But, but it's tied to the interest rate and it's tied to how big the loan is and say to, to the yeah, length of the loan, et cetera. I see. And of um, the, of the 11,500 total cars you sold last year, about what percent will actually do financing? Um, 65% do financing. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's higher than I would have thought. So you're talking what 7,000 loans. Yeah. Yeah. So we, 65% do financing, but that's actually low compared to a traditional dealer. Okay. And a traditional dealer, that number is closer to 80%. So we are still working on kind of being able to service every type of the customer that we get, right? We don't have as good of a set of options for subprime, for example, yep. um, as we do for prime. And so if you're a subprime customer, we might not be able to get you a, a financing product. Uh, and that's uh, for a part of that, you know, missing piece between 65 and 80%. Um, not all of it, but some of it. But, you know, when I started Chip, no one believed that people would get a loan online. And obviously, you know, we've kind of shown that very much do. And people actually like that experience a lot because they're in control and they're not waiting in a dealership for four hours trying to get financing done. OK, so take me back. You did part of your series. Yeah. Series D was 70 million in, in debt, I think, or Series E was 70 million in debt. What are you using the debt for? You're not doing your own loans? No, the debt is to buy cars, right? Because we own the cars and you underwrite those with 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 a debt because there's an existing product that you can use to do that at a very low interest rate. But when we started Shift, we did want to do captive loans. It was kind of the vision. Um, my co-founder, Toby Russell, who's my co-CEO as well, he had actually been a Capital One before we started Shift. And part of the thinking was like learn about, a lot about financial services to get a financial services company going. But what you learn over time is that until you're doing about $100 million of securitization, uh, every quarter, uh, it's too expensive to do your own loans. So we need to get to about a billion dollars in sales, of which then 40% we'd be doing our, on our own. So like $400 million of loans on our own to be able to do them in a profitable way. So eventually, you know, out in 2024, 25, we will do capital loans, but we just need to grow to be large enough before we can do that. Um, uh, otherwise the costs are just way too prohibitive. How, um, how much, so again, your last round, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, actually, why don't you tell me, I won't guess. How much have you raised to date? We've raised about 225 million in equity and, uh, 75 million in debt. So about okay. 300 million. Okay. And last round was what date? Uh, we raised in, we did the first close in September 2018 and then second close in December of 2018. So there was about a year and, you know, two quarters ago. Okay. And that, that was 75 in debt and 70 million equity, a uh, hundred million equity, equity and 75 million in debt. Okay. Equity. Okay. Got it. And 75 debt. So on the debt side, how much purchasing power is that actually for you based off what, you know, your advance rates are from your back leverage? I can't, I don't think I can get that answer, but it's way more than we need to, um, to finance where the business is today. Okay. Cause one of the crucial things you're kind of managing for in this industry is time to sell Yes. because you're, you have a depreciating asset, right? And so you don't actually want to have too much inventory on hand at any given time because you want to move your inventory quickly. What is your time to so, sell right now on average? Um, it varies, uh, between low on and 30 days, high end 55 days. Okay. It depends on the type of inventory we're dealing with. More expensive cars take longer to sell. Yep. Um, versus the cheaper cars, value cars actually sell a lot. Is faster. that shorter than Carvana and competitors? Um, I don't know what Carvana is right now, but when, when they went public, I think it was 120 days. Oh, wow. It was okay, definitely, yeah. definitely shorter than their IPO. Cause I think it's unfair to compare us to them now because they've just had, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of marketing since then. Uh, and so it's like, uh, what that timeline might be now is very different, but at, kind of at IPO time, I think it's a fair comparison. Yeah. So that last round was, was over a year ago. Anyone on your path, you're raising every kind of 12 to 18 months, which means you are in the middle of raise right now. And this virus is throwing everything in the air. How are, how are you handling that? Yeah, we were planning on going out in the next um, <laughs> kind of month or so, basically, um, to start the, the funding process. 
Um, look, we are um, we're in strong shape financially, which is good, and we can weather some time, right? I think in practice, there's going to be a bunker mentality out there for 60 to 90 days, uh, and so nothing's going to happen. Um, and I think we all need to bunker down and kind of get ready for that. Um, and then we'll, um, you know, plan for um, uh, for the funding period after that. Now, I do think, look, in practice, valuations are going to come down, right? So I think not being overvalued right now is a good thing. I think we're lucky because I don't think we're overvalued um, compared to a lot of companies kind of out there. Um, and then secondly... Oh, wait, hold on. Take, what do you think overvalued is right now in terms of our revenue multiple? Um, well, I, I mean, it's by industry, but like... In general, startups have been valued very, very highly over the last, you know, five years, let's say. Yeah. And the market just lost 30%. Do you consider 10x more. revenue multiple high? For a software-only company, I would say probably on. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, that's not like Carvana is generally, well, before all this started, Carvana was being valued at somewhere between two and a half and three and a half x forward-looking revenue multiple because obviously our revenue is not the same as SaaS revenue. Um, and so to me, that was pretty rich. Right. And so um, I just think, I think that company values are going to come down. That's going to create a lot of challenges for companies in fundraising. Um, so I'm, I think we're lucky that we're not in that type of a situation um, uh, for, for us. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that we will benefit a little bit from the counter cyclicality in terms of demand for used cars. Um, as it usually happens in a counter-cyclical kind of environment. That's actually another reason not to be doing capital lending right now is because when the economy is weaker, you don't want to be doing your own loans because you just don't know what's going to happen. So, look, like, it's going to be tough, but I've been through tough before. This has not been, the shift has not been an easy ride. It's been, you know, pretty complex. And, um, you know, we are planning for it and we'll be, uh, we'll be in good shape. I, uh, Toby likes to joke that, hey, we go through a recession every year. Because the Q4 in this industry is very, very slow. Um, we, unlike every other retail business, which is like for Q4 is like really active for us, Q4 is very slow. And so we're kind of always getting ready for a recession after a very strong Q3 because we have so much fewer sales in Q4 yeah. than we do in Q3. So it's just a matter of like get through it. It's going to be really tough, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. George, we're running out of time. I want to get in one last question here. When you look at kind of the total business, obviously, I think it's very clear to the audience how you make money on the spread between what you buy and sell. There's obviously financing, there's warranties, et cetera. But if you look at the total revenue you guys did last year, there's obviously a percent that comes, or, or that's the question, actually. What percent comes from the margin between buy and sell versus the um, financing, the warranties? Yeah, right now, it's probably two thirds comes from the car and one third comes from the warranties and loans. Um, in the world which we want to be in over time, it's probably going to be closer to like um, 40, 60, maybe even 55, uh, 45. Um, like th that's the ideal world. Like really successful dealerships um, are actually closer to 60% um, loan uh, and warranty and 40% metal. But they also sell new cars, and new cars have lower margins on the metal, so it's a little bit of a different world. Yeah. Um, but but I think like we are trying to probably trying to get to a place where sixty percent of our revenue comes from the cars, and forty percent uh, comes from loans and warranties over the next eighteen twenty four months. And what did Carvana grow their revenue to to have a healthy IPO? Like, what do you feel like you have to get your revenue to before you even think about IPOing? I think once we do two fifty million in revenue um, in one year, then the year after that we should be able to. IPO. And just to be clear, you're using revenue as GMV, which is not true. I mean, sure, it's revenue, but not really. Well, no, it's actually revenue because um, in in an in an accounting sense, um, uh, gross revenue actually is different from GMV doesn't exist. Yeah. And in the car industry, you have to count your entire full value of the car um, as your um, as your revenue. Um, and, uh, and then you have warranty and loans on top of that, right? So GMV would only refer to the value of the cars. It wouldn't actually count the loan and the warranty revenue that you make uh, on top of that. Got it. So when but you look at Carvana, speaking, Carvana right? pre IPO, when you, when you take the, their margin, their average margin, what, how much rep, like yeah. of that kind of revenue were they actually doing on 300 top line? I don't actually know. I don't okay. remember. Okay. There is um, uh, there, in the auto industry there's a concept called gross profit, which is not exactly net revenue in the way that SaaS companies talk about. It's very different. But there is the number of gross profit, and I don't know what the gross profit is. But yes, people do track gross profit, um, obviously very closely as well. And 
Um, you know, but even very, very large companies are not at billions of gross profit. It's not possible. That's what, well, that's what I'm trying to back into. Like these SaaS CEOs interview doing three, four, 500 million bucks in ARR, right? Yeah. They, they wouldn't even think about IPO in, in today's world unless you've got at least 100 million bucks in ARR. I'm trying to like compare you to them, which is probably a false comparison, right? No, it's a very, it's a, it's a very different business. I think for us, like Carvana is the proof point, right? Because they've done it before. Uh, and so like they did it with 350 million the year before IPO of total revenue, yep. kind of apples to apples to what, what I'm talking about. I actually don't think you have to be that high. I think what really matters is volume. Like once you're past 15,000 cars a year, I think it's credible to go out public. At yeah. least based on what I'm hearing from investors, right? I've spent a lot of time with public market investors and that's kind of their general sense. Yeah, I mean, look, to wrap this up, right? If 11,500 total cars were sold last year at a $17,000 price on average, that's 200 million in what you're calling revenue. That's two yeah. thirds of your revenue, another one third on a warranty. So call it 300 million in well, see, that's the thing is that one third warranty loans, that's not a percent of the 200 million. That's probably yeah, a percent of your, yeah. About, about much lower yeah, yeah. No, yeah. We, made, we made probably like 10, maybe 15 million in, in loan and warranty revenue last year. Yeah, 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 yeah. So exactly. So then multiply that by two. So 200 million, right, in, in total revenue at a 15% margin puts you at 30 million in revenue from buying and selling cars, another 15 on top of that in loan and warranty. So 45 million in kind of, you know, revenue under the total sale. You feel like though, if you get up to $15,000 volume and 300, ish top line you'd be good to go to the public market yes for this business correct for a yeah. SaaS business i think it's a different very business different market. yeah very different well listen i've enjoyed the hell of this let's wrap up with the famous five george number one favorite business book oh god i don't think i, I don't really read business books <laughs> <laughs> all right number two is there a ceo you're following or studying uh well i mean i think right now probably jeff Bezos and elon musk are the best founders ceos and so those obviously i massively admire why doesn't amazon crush you why don't they do this um, well, they don't, they've talked a lot about cars and you can list new cars on them, but they don't sell them. Um, it's very hard to do. And so I actually would love, you know, for them to be more involved in this space versus the, where they are, but they've never really been after it. If Jeff offers you $3 billion to exit, do you sell? Um, I mean, I, I would certainly consider it. I don't know if I'll sell or not. Not really just up to me, right? <laughs> Good answer. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business, George? Oh, I don't think I could function without LinkedIn. Um, I say this a lot, actually. Like, I don't know how people founded companies before LinkedIn existed because I go to it like so often. And literally, you know, I pay what a thousand bucks for it a year. If they told me pay five thousand, I pay five thousand. It's like <laughs> I'm people being critical. All right, number four. Uh, how many hours of sleep you in every night? Um, I try to sleep for eight. I don't actually ever sleep for eight, but I always try to be in bed for close to eight. I probably sleep six and a half ish okay. on average. We just had kids um, in the last six months. So, so married? How, how many kids? Uh, two. We oh, just okay. had um, a son and a daughter in September. Um, and so I've had to move my schedule forward. I mean, I get up much earlier than I used to because mornings are a great time to spend time with them. So it's been a, a big adjustment for me because I usually go to bed at like one and wake up at like, you know, eight or eight, eight thirty. But now, like, they're up at six. And so you have to go to bed like earlier and be kind of you know, up at six married two kids. How old are you? Uh, I'm 42, 42. Last question. What's something you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh, I wish I knew that software was going to be, um, or like software development was going to be so important to my life. I probably should have studied at least like a little bit of CS, um, kind of in college that that, that was a big kind of miss on my part that I, I didn't fully appreciate. I never thought I'd do anything in tech. It was like, the last thing I thought about, I studied politics in college. I thought I was going to be in politics my whole life. Uh, but yeah, like I actually use a lot of what I learned in politics in, in building a business. Cause I think there's so much similarity, but you know, it definitely is a detriment for me not to having some semblance of technical knowledge. Um, and that's a big miss. And I wish I had gained that earlier. Guys, there you have it. Shift an easy, very easy way to buy and sell cars and a no-touch model. Launched in 2014, first car sold. Last year, 2019, 11,500 cars sold. Average price, fifteen dollars to $17,000. That's over $200 million or around $200 million in car sales, of which George has optimized to somewhere around a 15% margin there. So $30 million uh, they make on that. Then in addition to that, about one, uh, that's about two-thirds of the revenue. The other one-third comes from warranties and loans for about $45 million there as he bunkers down and prepares for whatever's going to come over the next couple months, uh, potentially an IP maybe once this settles out. George, we're rooting for you, man. Thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you, and I hope everybody stays safe.
Do you guys know I fight like heck to get these data points for you from these CEOs that rarely do these kinds of shows? If you want more shows like this, make sure you subscribe right now. We're trying to get 10,000 YouTube subscribers by the end of September here, 2019, and it would be in the world to me if you clicked now to subscribe. Additionally, I've got two more great interviews for you. If you want more data points from the world's leading SaaS CEOs, click and watch one of them right now.